Hello, and welcome to another installment of The Weird Chronicles. Each episode, we bring you tales of action and adventure from Malifaux and the other side. On today's episode, we witness the forging of a witchling stalker, those barely human monstrosities who exist only to assist Sonia Creed in her mission to hunt down rogue magic users. I hope you enjoy My Name is Master. My name is Master, Witchling Ritual, by Nicholas Volker. The East-West Line, number one, connects business interests in the East with frontier mining operations in the West. When the breach reappeared, the number eight line, known as the Malifaux Line, was quickly built as a branch off of this main line to serve the most lucrative mining operations in Malifaux. Many rich debutantes, seeking a thrill as they come of age, purchase passage on the Malifaux line. The blue car, so-called for the royal blue upholstered interior, was built to accommodate these passengers, many of whom call upon the Governor-General and spend a few days in his manor before returning to their home's earthside. Others feel the need to witness the reality of Malifaux so that they can boast to their friends about how they got their stockings muddy. These travellers continue their journey on Number 8 to Ridley Station, west of the city, which serves the freight interests of east-west steam transit. One of the passengers, Miss Julia Goodbody, was listening to her companion relating the history of the blue car's dining service when the door at the front of the car was kicked open by a young man. Julia's friend opened his mouth to say something when the man called out, Jeeves, get that guild car open, and gestured toward the other end of the blue car. Loud footfalls immediately followed. Julia and her companion watched, as the brassman burst through the door of the train car. Like a miniature locomotive in its own right, it charged through the car, issuing a shrill whistle in response to its master. Its metal frame demonstrated surprising agility, though it still managed to topple the champagne bucket, shattering a bottle across the floor. And like a child through gift wrapping, the mechanical man punched easily through the opposite door, disappearing to begin its siege on the armoured car beyond. The young man, whom Julia found dashing, sped behind the mechanical man, but ducked into the space between two passenger seats directly across the aisle from Julia and her friend. When they looked over at him, he touched his finger against his lips. The reason for the gesture was soon obvious, as two deputies hurried through the open door with their revolvers drawn. At seeing the two wealthy passengers in the car, the two men dropped their weapons to their sides. The leader tried to assure them, Ma'am, sir, said the deputy in front as he tipped his hat. Don't be alarmed. We'll have this criminal apprehended momentarily. The deputy's words were cut off by a loud buzz as an arc of electricity gripped both he and his associate. Their bodies twisted in pain and flashes of electricity glowed in their open mouths. Julia watched in morbid wonder as the bodies fell limp to the ground. She noticed the water from the champagne bucket pooling around them. She followed the path of the water along the floor to where the young man was crouched. Blue light buzzed around his fingers, which were dipped into the spilled water. He looked up at Julia, and that blue light flickered in his mischievous gaze. "'Who are you?' Julia barely managed a whisper. "'Name's Gabriel,' the blue-eyed man said as he stood up. Julia's companion rose nose to nose with Gabriel, looking him straight in the eye. The two men stood silent for a moment, and Julia held her breath, anticipating an altercation. Gabriel, though, acted casually, and with a quick shove sent the man crashing to the floor where he landed hard on his rear. Without a second glance at her friend, Gabriel reached out and grabbed Julia's hand, pulling her quickly into his arms. Her fingers curled into his shirt, as his eyes gazed into hers, her body clinging close. And they kissed. Julia's chest heaved, pressing her generous bust against Gabriel's body. The contents of her bodice, however, was not what he had come for. He pushed Julia from his embrace and turned to exit the blue car, leaving the stunned woman and her suitor behind. Crossing into the next car, Gabriel found that Jeeves had done his job. 
he had fit his steam-powered companion with a dynamo-driven buzz saw which allowed Jeeves to open the guild car like a tin can. Ever since arriving in Malifaux, Gabriel's talent for mechanics had developed dramatically, especially electrical components, and he felt a certain kinship with Jeeves. The electricity that flowed in Gabriel's veins was in Jeeves as well. They were God and creation. The car was filled with steam from Jeeves's exertion, and two more guild deputies lay unconscious on the floor. The mechanical man had located the safe and dropped to one knee in front of it. Reaching out, Jeeves's giant claw latched onto the front of the safe. A bolt in the automaton's elbow spun, detaching the claw from its arm. Its payload in place, Jeeves rose and made room for Gabriel, who quickly approached the safe. The claw was loaded with explosives, and Gabriel pulled a pin out of the device, priming it for detonation. Taking a moment to make sure everything was ready, Gabriel took shelter in a corner of the car, while Jeeves's metal body hovered over him to protect him from the imminent blast. With a satisfying boom, the car shook violently, threatening to derail, while the wheels howled loudly as they fell back into place. The result was less than ideal. Instead of blowing the door off the safe, the detonation blasted the safe through the wall of the car and sent it tumbling into a ditch alongside the track. Precious soul stones, the most valuable treasure of Malifaux, rained through the air as the safe tumbled end over end through the ditch. The floor of the car was littered with soul stones as well, and these Gabriel, after cursing his luck, frantically worked to scoop into a burlap sack. The dynamite blast was quickly followed by gun blasts. The always loyal Jeeves quickly put himself between the gunman and Gabriel, the bullets ricocheting off of its metal hull. The gunman, however, wasn't a blundering deputy to be easily dispatched. With his sixth bullet, the gunman sighted down the length of his revolver and fired. Every knight has a chink in his armour, and Jeeves was no different. The magic that animated this steam golem was contained in the black market soul stone mounted in the creature's head. Gabriel had come to view his mechanised cohort as a real person, and the magic in that stone to be the creature's soul. With that sixth gun blast, Jeeves's soul stone exploded into a rain of tiny shards. Each twinkled with a final flare of magic before dimming and littering the floor. Jeeves, no! Gabriel howled. Lifeless, the machine toppled forward, revealing to Gabriel his murderer. Standing in the ruined doorway of the guild car was Samael, the famous guild witch hunter. Gabriel recognised him from his frequent picture in the paper, credited with the capture of dozens of arcanists. Between them, Jeeves's ruined boiler smouldered, filling the car with smoke. You're right to mourn him. There's no heaven for walking boilers, and there's no heaven for thieves either, Samael stated coldly. Overcome with rage at the death of his comrade, Gabriel stood and faced off against the witch hunter. Lifting his hands over his head, energy surged in his blood and boiled into his flesh, erupting as brilliant arcs of lightning. His hands shot forward and the electricity jumped through the air, full of deadly malice. The lightning didn't communicate Gabriel's wrath well, however. It dimmed in mid-arc and struck feebly against Samael's chest and the pendant he wore there. It was a ward against Gabriel's magics, specifically crafted to defeat his particular talents. With Jeeves dead and his magics rendered impotent, Samael had the upper hand. You're not going to take me in, Samael. You'll have to kill me, Gabriel said defiantly. Have it your way. Samael casually flipped open the cylinder of his revolver and reloaded it with rounds from his belt. With a snap of his wrist, the cylinder snapped closed, and he levelled his pistol at the defeated Gabriel. Samael approached slowly, and Gabriel slumped to his knees, bowing his head. In those moments, even the sound of the rail seemed silent. The air thickened, and Gabriel found it difficult to draw breath, as if the chill of death's presence had fouled the air. He felt foolish, looking back on his life and this stunt to rob the guild. He'd been so sure of himself, 
and had imagined such grand dreams which he would have conjured after possessing the soul stones. In those final moments of his life, Gabriel contemplated the series of blunders that had led him to this. There was a loud thwack, which was curiously unlike a gun blast. Gabriel opened one eye, chancing to look up at his killer. What he saw was the greatest stroke of luck he'd ever witnessed. Julia looked magnificent. She was an angel, her billowing gown fluttering around her ankles by the wind passing through the wrecked car. Above her head, she held Jeeves's smokestack which she had used to club Samael, and the witch hunter lay at her feet, knocked out cold. Gabriel shot to his feet and embraced the woman in his arms, kissing her passionately. Then, pulling away and taking up his sack of salvaged soul stones, he gestured to the hole in the train car. Ladies first, make sure you hit the ground rolling. Julia grinned happily and nodded her head confidently. She gathered up her skirts and leapt. She was an angel, at least she flew like one. She landed in the ditch as gracefully as anyone could manage and quickly rolled to a stop. With a look over his shoulder at Jeeves's fallen body, Gabriel went to collect the smokestack Julia had discarded. He touched his hand against the sack of soul stones at his side. Jeeves's legacy would live on in the generation these stones would allow. Returning to the hole in the side of the train car, he whispered a soft goodbye and followed Julia through the air. Gabriel woke slowly. It was a grand dream. He had disposed the corrupt governor-general and ruled Malifaux from the tyrant's mansion with an army of soul-fired automatons. Money, women, milk, honey, all his. He was magnificent and powerful as the mines of Malifaux fed his coffers and gave life to his mechanical militia. But as he gazed down on his domain from his ivory tower, smoke rose from the city and a mob approached. Their torches spread out around him like the stars lighting the night sky. Foreboding gripped him, roused him, but the scent of smoke lingered. Fear suddenly shook him, and Gabriel realised the mob was not the source of the smoke. All around him flames licked at the walls, quickly climbing overhead. The rafters crackled and popped, falling from the ceiling as glowing cinders. Alarmed, he turned and pulled at the sheets beside him, but Julia was already gone. He jumped from his bed, spilling his stolen soul stones onto the floor, and sped down the stairs as the sun rose beneath an arc of flame that was once the door of his home. He threw himself through the fiery doorway, the remnants exploding into flaming splinters around him. It was then that a powerful blow struck him. Laid out on the ground, embers rained down, and above him hung an enormous, broad-bladed sword. Gabriel had run face first into the flat of that blade like a clothesline. His head spun and his vision blurred, but he was conscious long enough to see a woman drop the blade to her side and discard a cigarette with the flick of her finger. She smirked and shook her head. Blowing out a plume of smoke, she said, This is not going to be a good day for you, my friend. Beside her was the towering form of Samael, clasping a struggling Julia in his arms, his hand firmly over her mouth. Gabrielle struggled to wake up. He had not dreamed. It was impossible for him to know how much time had passed. He tried to move, but quickly found that his wrists were shackled. Heavy chains bound him to loops of iron embedded in the stone floor. Torches lit the chamber, and Gabrielle saw that strange characters had been painted in a circle around him. He had no idea what the characters said, but he knew what they were. Practitioners prided themselves on many things, including the knowledge of languages long dead. The circle scribed around him was guild magic drawn from some ancient dusty tome. Magic Gabriel didn't know. He wasn't alone in the chamber. Seeing the woman, leaning casually against the wall, puffing her cigarette, Gabriel immediately reacted. He felt the eager energy inside him boiling in his blood. The power of Malifaux was in him, and raising his hands, he lashed out at the woman with all the arcane force he could muster. The power came, and with it incredible pain. 
Gabriel roared in agony as a magic backfired, consuming him in excruciating fire. This was not the kind of fire that burned in tavern fireplaces, and this was not the pain of burning flesh. Gabriel's skin was spared, his hair was not singed, but deep inside he felt a pain more terrible than the body has capability of sensation. That most integral part of him, that ethereal component of life. The fire caught hold and burned him from the inside out with a flash of tormenting heat. The flame was gone just as quickly as it arrived and left Gabriel's body curled on the floor, his screams still echoing in the chamber. For several long moments, nothing happened. Then the scent of smoke returned. This was tobacco smoke, and it was followed by the whispered words of his captor. My name is Sonia. When you're ready, we'll talk. Catch your breath, friend. Gabriel heard wood drag against stone as Sonia pulled a chair up to the perimeter of the binding circle. She waited patiently, and Gabriel slowly recovered, the pain in his gut dulling. He sucked in a deep breath and gathered his strength. Pulling his knees under him, he pressed his hands against the floor and lifted his head. His eyes met the woman's, and he opened his mouth to speak. But she didn't give him an opportunity, flicking her cigarette in his face as soon as he set eyes on her. The hot ember burned a spot on his brow, and ash showered his face. Idiot, we're not here to talk. Rage sparked in Gabriel, and unbidden, the power inside of him flared. Instinctively, he lashed out again. What would normally manifest as bolts of lightning from his fingertips, a trick that allowed him to easily overcome the guards on the train, instead travelled down the chains of his shackles and out towards the circle inked on the stones around him. The black runes glowed in malevolent purple as the energy rebounded off the circle and leapt back up the chains to ignite that hellfire inside of him. Gabriel howled, but his rage fueled the fire, and it did not relent. With his hate to fuel it, the fire would burn until there was nothing left of him to consume. His cries filled the chamber, the shrill sound of true suffering. But his captor called out over the sounds, and her voice penetrated his world of pain. What you're feeling is that wellspring of power inside you being burned away. What once empowered you made you confident, will be gone, and you will be just a meek, hollow man. Inside you, there will be a hole, and that void will hunger for the power it once knew. With that hunger will come a sensitivity to the magics of your fellow criminals. I will use your new sense to track down others like you, and you will help me. You'll help me, because you will hate them for the power they wield, envious of the strength you once had. You will enjoy it. I promise. Despite his agony, Gabriel heard every word, and he was terrified that she was correct. He knew she was right, because he could feel the part of him that would be able to resist burning to ashes. His fingers curled against the cold stone beneath him, frantically trying to grasp hold of his identity and save it from being devoured. What would survive would be his anger, his hate. That last bit of his rebellion was snuffed out, and the fire in him flared, pouring out of him as a noxious green vapour. Sonia backed away as it poured from his eyes and mouth. The unhealthy mist washed over the chains that bound him, quickly working their corrosion on the metal. Twisted by pain and hate, his body was changed too. The strength in him was evaporated away, and he appeared as the empty husk he was. Just as his home had been burned from the inside out, only a shell of his body remained also. His limbs were knotted and bent, his hairless flesh like ancient wrinkled parchment. Standing over the pathetic creature, Sonia watched as the transformation took hold. If you want to be paid in Guildstone, you work for the Guild. I think you will enjoy your new career.
she produced a large blade from a tangle of burlap nearby and tossed it on the floor in front of what remained of Gabriel. In the noxious proximity of the creature, the metal pitted and lost its polished shine. My name is Master. Here is your weapon. Gabriel looked up from the blade with his hollow eyes and bowed his head. Yes, Master. That's it for another episode of The Weird Chronicles. Join us next time for more tales of action and adventure.